Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lisman once again from YouTube channel Jörgler66 and I will now continue reading in the book Rulers of Evil, written by F. Tapper Saucy and published in 1996. Last time we stopped at the reading on chapter 14 and I will with that continue today with chapter 15 of the book called The Madness of King George III. Upon the death in 1732 of Thomas Howard, 8th Duke of Norfolk and real founder of American Freemasonry, the Norfolk title passed to Thomas's brother Edward. In a curious way, the 9th Duke of Norfolk played a part in the founding of the United States as well, albeit a cameo role means a hidden role. Sun Tzu wrote about this, quote, Multiply your spies, put them everywhere, in the very palace of the enemy prince, have a list of the principal officers who are at his service. Know their first and last names, the number of their children, their relatives, their friends, their servants. Let nothing happen to them that is not known to you." Unquote. Now when you think of the time we live in in 2015, does that sound any familiar about what the so-called intelligence agencies do with all the people who are always interconnected with the so-called social media and they tell the principalities, they tell the enemy everything freely about their children, their relatives, their friends, their servants and so on? Do you see where this all comes from? This is Jesuit casuistry and sophistry used in the modern social media as we know it of today. <laughs> but okay, let's go back some 300 years now. Continue reading. Edward, the ninth Duke of Norfolk, was a regular in the crowd of Frederick William, Prince of Wales, and his princess Augusta of Saxony. The Valaises were party creatures, an ongoing disappointment to the prince's father, King George II. The king represent, uh, resented, sorry, the king resented that his son appeared not to have inherited his craving for war. George the Second was the last British monarch to lead his army into battle, which he did against the Spanish in 1739. George despised his son's Ignatian entourage. When Frederick William ran up an exorbitant tap entertaining foreign ambassadors at St. James's Palace, the king cut his allowance, shooed the ambassadors away, and ordered the couple to move out of St. James's and take up a simpler residence at Leicester House. In 1738, Augusta gave birth to a son, George William. At the age of six, the child was placed under the tutelage of Dr. Ayscore. Like the Society of Jesus, Ayscore did not wish the head of the Church of England well. Quote, he is chiefly remarkable, unquote, says Britannica, quote, as an adherent to the opposition. Unquote. Ayscore's role in history was to keep the future King of England, who suffered emotionally under the ungainable squabbles dividing father and grandfather, virtually illiterate for more than five years. The Prince of Wales was fond of horse racing. One afternoon in 1747, so the official story goes, a sudden downpour of rain confined him and a handful of friends to his tent at the Egham races. Determined to play cards, the Prince sent Edward, ninth Duke of Norfolk, out in the rain to find someone who, to make up a whist party. The Duke returned with a strikingly handsome Scot, John Stuart, the third Earl of Butte. Quote, Butte immediately gained the favor of the prince and princesses, says Britannica, and became the leading personage of their court. Unquote. What Britannica omits saying, along with every other source I could find on this leading character in the formation of Anglo-American relations, is that Butte, like Norfolk, was a secret brother of the Lodge. This fact is ascertainable, ascertainable only from the keystone of the Ark over Butte's mausoleum in St. Mary's Cemetery in Rothesay, Isle of Butte, in the Firth of Clyde, west of Glasgow. 
carved into that keystone is the familiar Masonic disembodied all-seeing eye. Born in 1713, educated at Eton, Bute was elected in 1737 to the representative peerage for Scotland. He never opened his mouth in debate. When his bid for re-election failed, he returned to the family estate on the Isle of Bute, whose remarkably temperate climate produces a lush foliage, even palm trees. There he indulged in a passion for botany, that can be experienced to this day in the verdant grounds at Mount Rothesay. In 1745, Bute suddenly left Rothesay and took up residence in London. The year 1745 is distinguished by the so-called Jacobite Rebellion, another wondrous Sun Tzuan Ruse, in which apparent defeat for the Society of Jesus masked a hidden victory. The Jacobite Rebellion aimed to restore Roman Catholic rule over England by deposing George II and placing James II grandson Charles Stuart, better known as Bonnie, Charlie, Bonnie Prince Charlie, on the throne. However, when Charlie marched on London with a band of Scottish devotees, no Catholic politician of any prominence would desert George II. The rebellion was forced to abort. Charlie escaped to France, and the Scots were massacred. Clearly, this was a Catholic disaster. Or was it? Such extensive Catholic support for a Protestant king assured England that the monarchy would be forever Protestant. A Catholic England was now an impossible dream. The Jesuits could give up. Englishmen could now relax with them in their midst, just as Jesuits could now go about their business without causing official alarm. The Jacobite rebellion made England at last safe for the Black Papacy. The Jesuits secured a new cover by blowing their cover. Quote, Blown cover as cover, unquote, in the parlance of the CIA, which does not only stand for Central Intelligence Agency, but I call it the Catholic Intelligence Agency. The Sun Tzuan general wins whatever the circumstances. When Bute joined the court of the Prince and Princess of Wales, their son, George William, was an emotional basket case. But lavished attention on the lad, won his trust, uh, sorry, I have to continue again, I read the wrong, uh, the wrong word here. Bute lavished attention on the lad, won his trust and administration, and became his mentor. Indeed, Bute made himself so delightfully indispensable around Leicester House, that the prince appointed him in 1750 to the most intimate position on his staff, Lord of the Bad Chamber. Now what do you think that means, being Lord of the Bath Chamber? Lord of the Bath Chamber, meaning that he shared every secret, even the secrets of the Bath Chamber, with his so-called mentor, with Bute, in this case. Nothing happened in the life of the two heirs to the throne of England that was not privy to a man under obedience to the unknown superior, which is, of course, the Black Pope. But in the year following Bute's appointment, the prince died mysteriously at the age of 44. Rumors that Bute was responsible circulated for a while and evaporated. However, gossip linking Bute romantically to Princess Augusta never went away, even though he was husband to a devoted wife and happy family. Happy family. George II, surprisingly desolate over the prince's untimely death, remained an absurdly stern grandfather to George William. Until his own death in 1760, George II grew increasingly melancholic and disinterested in ruling. Parliament gained strength. Bute acted the surrogate father to the future king. Caring for the gardens at Leicester House, he inspired the boy with a lifelong interest in botany. He encouraged him to patronize the arts. The composer Handel, though blind, was still superintending performances of his works at the, loyal, at the royal behest. However, Bute did little 
to ally George's tormenting fears for inadequacy. Reinforcing himself as the ideal of conduct, the Scot porished, nourished the boy's self-distrust, which would become the most prominent feature of his maturity. Well, what maturity are we talking about when this guy <coughs> can probably not even very much think for himself, as we can understand what Tapasaw he wrote here. Such was the context of English power when Lorenzo Ricci tipped the stones in the Ohio Valley that tumbled into a costly war between England and France. Six years into the war, George II died at the age of 77. He left behind a disunited parliament and a dysfunctional heir barely out of his teens. George William, now King George III, fearfully turned the British Empire over to John Stuart. Bute acted swiftly to conform to the wishes of his unknown superior. He began by appointing a more compliant First Lord of the Treasury, the office later to be known as Prime Minister. Next, with secretly funded, grant, funded grants, he purchased votes from key members of Parliament widely known as, quote, the King's Friends, unquote. Under the noble pretext of achieving, quote, a closer unity of the British Empire under Parliament, unquote, Bute whipped the King's friends into passing a law to enforce writs of assistance across the Atlantic. These were revenue-raising warrants issued summarily under the royal seal requiring a law officer to take possession of lands without trial, without jury. One does not need a doctorate in political science to know that summary expropriation is a sure way to divide an empire, not unite it. When the writs were enforced in Massachusetts, James Otis resigned his advocate general's post in the court of admiralty to preach against them, quote, in a style of oratory, unquote. John Adams, who you probably all know, one of your former presidents of the United States later on, John Adams would later recall, quote, that I have never heard equaled in this or any other country, unquote. In July 1776, Adams would declare that the enforcement of Butte's writs of assistance in 1761 was, quote, the commencement of this controversy between Great Britain and America. Unquote. Lorenzo Ricci's war, or the Maritime War, or the French and Indian Wars, came to an end in 1763. England was the, was the apparent victor. Bute was sent by his protege, George III, to negotiate a peace in Paris. Assisted by Robert Petty, Lord Shelburne, the notorious quote, Jesuit of Berkeley Square, unquote, Bute perfected the Treaty of Paris. Under its terms, England won from France all of Catholic Quebec and the region east of the Mississippi, except for the island of New Orleans. This was such a great territorial windfall for the colonists that North Cath Carolinians created Butte County in the northeastern part of the colony. However, Butte restricted the windfall by ordering the infamous Royal Proclamation of 1763, which prohibited Americans from moving west of a line drawn along the crest of the Allahanny Mountains. Most colonists viewed the proclamation as a scheme to imprison them between the Alleghenies and the Atlantic. To purchasers of western real estate prior to the treaty, it was legalized theft. The churchgoers saw a papal advance. Quote, With Roman Catholicism no longer actively persecuted in England, many Americans concluded that the mother country was about to return to Rome. Unquote. Quote. There you see how some people saw through the deception already at that time and saw that the rise of Roman Catholicism was when no longer persecuted in England, of course meaning that England in time would turn back to Roman Catholicism. And when England turns back to Roman Catholicism, as they thought, they, of course, surely had to divide from England, not to fall under papal authority themselves, 
what the Protestant inhabitants of the colonies in the New World, of course, resisted and feared, because they just fled from there, as we've learned before. But okay, continue reading. Prior to Lorenzo Ricci's accession to the Black Papacy in 1758, the colonists had been blissfully loyal to the mother country. Looking back on the pre-Ritchian years, while testifying before the House of Commons in 1766, Benjamin Franklin called that, quote, the colonists were governed by England at the expense only of a little pen, ink and paper. They were led by a threat, unquote. Yet, with the rise of Ritchie, as if in preparation for the absurdities of Butte, radical propagandists began appearing throughout the colonies. Christopher Graston in South Carolina, Cornelius Harnett in North Carolina, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson in Virginia, and, in Pennsylvania, Charles Thompson. The dean of all these propagandists was Samuel Adams, the celebrated, quote, father of the American Revolution, unquote, and Freemasonry's, quote, dominant figure in the mobilization of the Boston artisans and inland, inland towns, unquote. John Adams, in a letter dated February 9, 1819, framed his, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> framed his cousin Sam's political activism within exactly the 17 years of Lorenzo Ricci's generalate. Quote, Samuel Adams, to my certain knowledge, from 1758 to 1775, that is, for 17 years, made it his constant rule to watch the rise of every brilliant genius, to seek his acquaintance, to court his friendship, to cultivate his natural feelings in favor of his native country, to warn him against the hostile designs of Great Britain, and to fix his affections and reflections on the side of his native country." Unquote. Thus, well before the advent of much to rebel against, well before Bute's writs of assistance and the royal proclamation, a propaganda of American rebellion was being organized. At the same time, Dr. Franklin put together the means of disseminating it. The, of disseminating it. He streamlined the colonial postal system to flow smoothly and efficiently from southern Virginia through eastern New England. On the diplomatic front, England's future war-making capability was stunted by the Paris negotiations of Butte and Shelburne, which isolated England from any possibility of forming helpful European alliances. This, in 1763, was of negligible importance to anyone but the foreknowing and omniscient Lorenzo Ricci. When the hour came for America to revolt for independence and no one but Ricci knew when that hour would come, England had to be friendlessly alone. Having weakened England and stimulated the production of hostile, divisive rhetoric in America, Bute resigned from public life a very unpopular man. But the king's mentor was not yet finished. From the shadows, Bute handpicked a new prime minister, George Grenville. Grenville made a broad show on refusing to accept office unless the king promised never again to employ Bute in office or seek his counsel. The king promised. Pledging to give the British Empire a thorough overhauling, Grenville then proceeded, with Bute's secret counsel and more money grants from the king's friends, to create dynamic situations that accelerated Britain and the colonies toward divorce. Duties were increased on colonial imports, justified by the notion that the colonies should contribute their fair share to the increased expenses of running an empire much expanded by the Treaty of Paris. Higher duties heightened smuggling activities, which in turn increased the admiralty caseload. Americans began sniffing tyranny in the breeze. Grenville's new Sugar and Molasses Act enforced ruinous duties on foreign staples necessary for rum making. The act re uh, reduced imports of sugar and molasses from the French, Spanish and Dutch West Indies, which in turn greatly reduced the meat, fish, flour, horses and lumber, 
which the colonies could export to the islands. This caused a slump in colonial production. Large debts, which colonists owed to their British creditors for furniture, clothing, ironware, pottery, jewellery and many other articles, went unpaid. Merchants complained that Parliament was killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Parliament's strange response was to prohibit the colonies from issuing paper currency to supply their lack of gold and silver. George Grenville did, however, invite, invite the fuming colonists to propose suggestions for how they would like to be taxed. When the colonists refused to dignify the invitation with a response, Parliament in March 1765 passed, without debate or opposition, an even more infuriating measure. The Stamp Act required the purchasing and fixing of stamps to all colonial deeds, leases, bills of sales, pamphlets, newspapers, advertisements, mortgages, wills and contracts. If duties on sugar and molasses could be considered part of the regulation of the Empire's trade, the Stamp Act was a tax levied by a body thousands of miles away for the sole purpose of raising a revenue. It affected all classes of colonists. Never before had Parliament dared to impose such a tax. Whereas the duty on foreign molasses or anti-smuggling measures were felt only by the great merchants in New York, Boston, Philadelphia or Charleston, the Stamp Act affected a wider public. It added the price of a stamp to, a, uh, to the lawyer's bill of every colonist selling a horse, making a will or mortgaging a house. The price of every newspaper was increased by the stated value of the stamp attached to it. In Massachusetts, Britannus Americanus, one of Sam Adams' more than 20 pseudonyms, charged that it was as absurd for Parliament to tax the American people as it would be for an assembly of Americans to tax the people of England. <laughs> I agree. In Virginia, Patrick Henry cried his slogan, quote, No taxation without representation, unquote. From the London Coffee House in Philadelphia, Charles Thompson led a secret club of workers, teachers, merchants and professionals in advocating the production and sales of local goods strengthened by an intercolonial agreement not to import goods from Britain. A month before the first stamps arrived, Sam Adams agitated Massachusetts to hold a, quote, Stamp Act Congress, unquote, which convened at New York in October. The Congress drew up a declaration of rights and grievances protesting by the, uh, that the act threatened, quote, the liberties of the colonies, unquote. By the time the stamps arrived from England in November, the colonists had forced most of the stamp distributors to resign. The merchants of Boston, New York and Philadelphia agreed not to import English goods, causing a decline in trade with Great Britain of about 25% within a year. In an address before the House of Commons, Benjamin Franklin issued his famous warning that if troops should be sent to the colonies to enforce the act, they, quote, will not find a revolution there, but might very well create one, unquote. Grenville's ministry suddenly fell to William Pitt and Lord Rockingham, who repealed the Stamp Act in March. The colonies rejoiced and pledged loyalty to George III. They hardly noticed that the king's friends had, had accompanied the repeal with a declaratory act claiming, quote, full power and authority to bind the colonies and people of America, subjects of the crown of Great Britain, in all cases whatsoever, unquote. Regarding Patrick Henry's objections to unfair taxation as, quote, so, so much nonsense, unquote, Charles Townsend, Chancellor of the Exchequer, vowed to get, quote, plenty of revenue from the colonies, unquote. In the summer of 1767, he and the King's friends passed acts laying duties on glass, painter's colors, red and white lead, paper and tea, 
shipped to America. I guess you all heard about that tea tax, right? <laughs> so you see, it goes much further than that what is told in your official history books. But the acts produced little revenue. By Townsend's own estimate, made shortly before his premature death at 42, the British Treasury stood to gain no more than £40,000. The real, covert purpose of the acts appears to have been not to get quote-unquote plenty of revenue, but to stimulate the rebellious investment of colonial capital in local manufacturing. In March of 1770, a small crowd of jeering Bostonians pelted a few British redcoats with snowballs. Snowballs! The angry redcoats fired into the crowd, killing four men, wounding several more. The town and surrounding countryside reacted in rage to the Boston Massacre. Samuel Adams led his disciples to the mansion of acting governor Thomas Hutchinson and demanded the immediate deportation of the Redcoats, who wisely retreated to Castle William on the harbour. When news of the massacre reached England, the king's friends scolded Hutchinson's quote, cowardly surrender to Sam Adams's regiments, unquote. Thenceforth, each anniversary of the Boston Massacre became an occasion for Adams and others to make more blistering orations against British tyranny in favour of independence. In 1770, Lord North, the new Prime Minister, declared the Townsend Act were costing more to collect than the revenue was returning to the Treasury. <laughs> so, what do you do when something costs more than it brings? You probably abolish it, eh? North secured the repeal of all the towns and duties, except the tax on tea, of three pence a pound, to prove Parliament had authority to tax the colonies. <laughs> Get this, I'm going to read this again. This is very, very profound. <laughs> Lord North, the new Prime Minister declared the Townsend Acts were costing more to collect than the revenue was returning to the Treasury. North secured the repeal of all the Townsend duties except a tax on tea of three pence a pound to prove Parliament had authority to tax the authority. So this was not to get revenue, this was just an act of proving that the Parliament of England had authority over the colonies and to tax the colonies. And the colonists weren't affected by this minuscule tax, since most of their tea was smuggled from Holland anyway. Feelings toward England turned amicable once again, as colonial merchants increased orders from British firms from £1,336,122 in 1769 to £4,200,000. Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, Charles Thompson and Thomas Jefferson took advantage of the lull to agitate. Agitate, that is what Jesuits do. Observing the first anniversary of the Boston Massacre on March 5, 1771, Adams called for action and solidarity. Quote, it is high time for the people of this country explicitly to declare whether they will be freemen or slaves. Let it be the topic of conversation in every social club. Let every town assemble. Let associations and combinations be everywhere set up to consult and recover our just rights. Unquote. Between 1770 and 1773, about the only troublesome confrontations were those between British revenue vessels and smugglers. The colonies began producing more. Trade was so brisk that merchants, formerly the chief opponents of the British rule, had little to protest. They turned their full attention back to business. And then Lorenzo Ricci nudged his weightiest boulders to date. The religious right, the Protestant churchgoers. How he did this is the subject of our next chapter. That is then chapter 16. And that interestingly starts with a portrait by Gilbert Stewart, made from John Carroll, who, will we who will, as we will learn later on, became the Bishop of Baltimore 
and founder of Georgetown University. So now follows a very interesting and profound chapter in the book Rulers of Evil, chapter 16, called Tweaking the Religious Right. But I'm going to take my time to read on this, and because I already took half an hour reading the first part, chapter 15, I will put this into another part. And I want you all to make sure to get the book via the download link that I provide in the description box of this video and to read it for yourself to get and to gain a deeper understanding on how the Jesuits who are always behind these actions made the Americans more or less just wanting to get away from so-called yoke of England because of what? A tax of three pence on a pound of on a pound of tea where they got the most tea anyway by importing it from Holland and not from England? Don't you see what deception there is laid and how easy it is to rewrite history for the Jesuits in this case? So I hope you enjoyed this little short reading of just one chapter, chapter 15, but I have to go into chapter 16 and I think that I will <laughs> surely take at least also half an hour, but I really want to have them apart instead of together, so I'm going to close my reading down here. Thanks for listening and do not forget, please spread the message, spread this audio that other people also can learn on the real rulers of evil, on the real rulers of behind the scenes as we know them today and of the Jesuits role and the Roman Catholic role of founding the nation state of United States of America in 1776. As you will learn on when you s watch some videos that I've made on Hour of the Truth and reading through the book of um, the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy that Walt Stickle put together, and when you read that book that you can also get for free on online and in, in every broadcast on our of the truth video the link is uh, published there that you can see that then you will really see how the Jesuits work both sides to get their agenda and that is exactly what it is written also in the Jesuit oath so there's no doubt about that you just have to do your own research and you have to read some of these books like Rulers of Evil. So, until next time, I hope you enjoyed it. God bless you and bye bye.